All right. Welcome, everyone, to the PTZ Optics live stream. Today, we have an exciting panel. It's our Higher Education 2020 Spring and Summer, right? Is it spring yet? Is it summer yet? I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been a crazy time lately. But uh, I'm joined with a panel of guests. Uh, one of our buddies over here is actually using the auto tracking camera, which is going to be pretty fun. And uh, Julia Sherwin is my co-host today, joining via Zoom. Hi, Julia. Hi, Paul. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Julia has helped put together a little presentation on higher education. So we're going to share that in our Zoom session. And please feel free to jump in at any time. We are looking at the... Um, we're looking at our, um, social media so we can say hi on YouTube and Facebook and bring comments in from there, but also perhaps more importantly, all the folks in zoom, thank you for being here. Uh, it's going to be a fun session and I'm excited to have all you guys part of this today. So let's start with letting you guys know to ask questions. And if you'd like to join this Zoom session, you can do so uh, by emailing julia.sherwin at ptzoptics.com for the meeting information. So what's going on out there in higher education? It's 2020. A lot of times higher education institutions take the time between June, July, and August to prepare for the fall semester. And this spring semester has really been something that's going to go down in the history books. Uh, campus shutdowns have led to a surge in remote learning. And we're really excited to hear from all of you that are joining today about what that has entailed, whether it's a, a technology story, a success story, or even something that we can learn from. Um, but this surge in remote learning is something that is really changing the game. And a really well-renowned educator and leader of Western Governor's University has said this crisis has laid bare to the challenge of digital equity and the educational disruptions that students of all ages have faced this year and maybe next year too are going to require some new approaches. And we'll see more transformation in the K through 12 and higher ed in the next five years than we did in the past 25 years. So this crisis will be the mother of invention. And if that doesn't say it in a nutshell, we need to buckle up for a lot of change coming, coming forward. So it's, it's going to be an interesting time. And there's a lot of camera technology that's being implemented and that we are a camera company here at PTZ Optics and Huddle Cam. So we're really looking forward to partnering with folks. And we have a demo program and we're going to do a live demo today uh, to try to you know, help equip some of the spaces, whether it's a small classroom or maybe something like the Huddle Cam HD Simple Track 2, which is our auto tracking camera. And just to make this fun, before we get into the presentation, we were thinking, why don't we do a live demo of the Simple Track 2, which is an auto tracking camera that has a 20x optical zoom camera on top, but a uh, 4K uh, reference camera at the bottom. And I was wondering if Patrick over here would be willing to do a little um, live demo for us, Patrick. Um, so I'm going to spotlight his video. There we go. Let's see. Here we go. And so Patrick, uh, can, can we talk to you? Do you have a, a speakerphone on or did I mute you in Zoom? Patrick is uh, in our studio here. I should be able to talk. Can you hear me? There we go. Hey, Patrick. Hey. So Pat is using the Huddle Cam HD Simple Track 2. And um, he's been nice enough to uh, come over to, this, to the office and show us how, it, how it's being used. So Patrick, it's all basically an auto tracking camera. And it's, you're just showing us how it follows you, right? Correct. Yeah, so if you were a teacher at the front of a room, um, or, you know, a college professor uh, in front of an auditorium, something like that. This is perfect for those scenarios where you're not going to be, um, you know, solely at a podium, or if you have a bit more animated teachers that move around the room a bit more, uh, 
no worries about having a cameraman or a camera operator or somebody that needs to be there. This this will take care of making sure that the teacher, or professor, or whoever stays in, in, in the frame. So I love having a live demo because it's an opportunity to let people ask questions. Do you have the software there? Would you be able to show us that software? I can. Um, you know what? Mark is asking if we could, if you could put a lapel mic on, and I do think we need to get you one over there. I have a whole microphone system over there, but with the, we haven't been using this space, and I haven't upgraded it over there. But why don't yeah, you share no your screen, Pat? Yeah, sure thing. So, so that's the management software for the Simple Track. Yes, this is the Simple Track software. Um, you know, so the nice thing about these cameras is that you can put them all on a network, uh, and then you know use that to gain some sort of um, centralized control. Um, as you can see, it's it's tracking me, but you can turn that tracking control on and off. You can get manual tracking. Obviously, it pulls in a, a streaming preview to the to the right. Um, you can kind of set set some of these zones, uh, uh, you can set the tracking zone, adjust the video format, um, adjust some of the tracking parameters like pan speed, tilt speed, zoom limit, um, and a couple other things. Cool. Well, um, that's awesome. Do you want to show us the, uh, okay, that's good. Do you want to show us the advanced parameters and the blocking zones and things like that really quickly? And then we'll get, keep yes. moving on our presentation. All right. I think we have it kind of, wait, Never mind. Um, so yeah, what you can do is very quickly, you will see me pull up the um, the parameters. So what I can do is set the tracking zone. Oh, as such. And then you can have set some blocking zones. So you have should be red. Oh, I just turned it off. Red and green. You should be able to see that. I think I actually. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. So, um, and. You have some auto zoom, some permanent track, a couple other features um, here as well. Third party control, just some some of the network features as well. Well, thank uh, you for showing us that, Pat. Why don't you stick around and uh, maybe we'll come back to that if necessary, um, because I do think it's kind of interesting. In fact, I have um, a little bit of a video from a business university that's using this with Echo 360, uh, which is a lecture capture system. And I'm, I'd love to hear from our panel and in the forum uh, about, you know, trying to automate the opportunity and the ability for folks to um, be able to make it easy for their teachers to be able to capture video. Um, so this is a auto tracking camera system, uh, the Huddle Cam HD Simple Track being installed in a couple different classrooms and computer room settings where the camera can automatically track the presenter, um, which really just kind of reduces the need for a camera operator. You can see here there's a USB connection for Zoom video conferencing, so it works really good for Zoom rooms and classrooms that have Zoom, but it also is nice for running SDI to a lecture capture system. And Pat was showing us that remote management software. So we just wanted to, to start by showing that because it's really a popular solution that we have for higher education. And then we want to just kind of high level look at the changes, the changing landscape that's become kind of the new normal. And then um, really open it up to our guests and our forum and everything else that we have talk to talk about today. So. With that being said, um, that was our live demo. And there's kind of two main things I think that people are, are coming to start to consider now. One is the classroom technology, and then the other is the work from home peripherals, right? The, how do we allow professors to 
to f- decide. And I'd love to hear from the audience and maybe Julia, you could chime in a little bit about what you've been hearing out there. But I feel like uh, the classrooms obviously need to be equipped and transformed uh, in the next five years. This massive change is going to happen. But also, I think that uh, teachers and you know faculty members are now working from home right now. And so they're needing to be equipped with webcams and, and video communication equipment in order to do their jobs effectively. Yeah, that's right, Paul. Adoption and training and getting everyone on board right now is so essential. Um, I couldn't help but notice that um, we have a guest today, Mark, and it says ASU. I don't know if we're able to unmute him, but if he's with Arizona State University, there was a really um, great feature article on ASU in the uh, recent issue of Campus Technology, which um, we certainly would recommend you all, you know, uh, look into some of these resources out there. We are experts on the camera side of things, of course, and integrating that technology, but um, picking up publications like Campus Technology, looking at um, like the Higher Education Technology Managers um, Association or Alliance, looking at groups like that uh, as additional sources of information are also helpful. But Arizona State's been doing this for quite some time. And, um, you know, they really started, they, they officially, I guess, launched their unit for this in 2014. Uh, it was a central unit focused on designing and scaling digital teaching and learning models to uh, increase student success. So um, this is certainly, you know, some colleges and universities have already been on board and have been doing this for some time. And those who weren't know now it's, it's game time. Yeah, I think that's such a, a good way to put it. And I, w- I would 100% agree. I read that d- um, distance learning has had already been growing year over year um, at a, at least 16% um, since, you know, for like the past 10, 20 years. So distance learning has been growing. Um, but now, you know, the unprecedented growth and the next five years, if you just look at them, it's going to be... Um, much accelerated, I would imagine. And the three key tools that we wanted to identify and talk about today are learning management systems, right? The digital hub for everything in the classroom, um, including the lectures. Uh, Video platforms. Panopto is a great one that I'm familiar with. But kind of learning-oriented video courses uh, designed to guide students uh, through, you know, a step-by-step course. And then, of course, video conferencing and online communications and delivering real-time live engaging class materials. So in our, in our video, and I might just kind of show this B-roll a little bit more as we, um, as we go through here, but the, um, th- this system is the Echo 360 system, and it allows per- students to look at a dual screen view. So uh, this little touch screen over here has uh, two video inputs, and one is the the teacher's presentation, and the other is the video camera. So the students, when they're watching this on the Echo 360 management system, they're able to choose which they'd like to see side by side or full screen, pause, rewind, and replay. And lecture capture is just really a high level term for describing the process of capturing lectures via video and making them available in the LMS, the learning management system. And um, essentially, the learning management system is a software application for administrators to document, track, report, and automate the delivery of their educational courses. And this uh, video that we were showing in particular, I just really like this one, with Echo 360, as soon as the class is over, it's automatically published to their learning management system. They were using Canva. And through the Echo 360 system, there's some extra kind of bells and whistles that are pretty cool. So this is the diagram that we were showing with the USB for those Zoom conferences, the real-time classroom settings there, the SDI for the Echo 360 and the lecture capture, and then of course the remote management software. And then there's also lecture capture from home, right? So so a lot of times teachers are recording videos and, and capturing footage from their own laptops. And Panapto has a great lecture capture. Kaltura 
has a lecture capture app. I'm interested to hear what others are using. Um, but you know, with working from home, a lot of teachers have been had to use their webcams, and uh, we're showing the HuddleCam HD Pro webcam here. In fact, I'm using this camera on this webcam on this uh, Zoom call right now, and it just kind of shows how the ability to kind of capture, record, and there's three different types of kind of virtual classrooms that we're hearing about. One is simply to capture the screen with a webcam. So it's more of a presentation, um, presenting to the webcam, walking people through a presentation. Sometimes there's picture in picture. Sometimes it's presentation and webcam or just webcam. Then there's the simulated classroom recordings. And this is more of a camera on a whiteboard or a presentation space, which makes it feel a little bit more like the traditional classroom where the presenter or the teacher is next to the whiteboard of the presentation space. And then finally, there are multi-camera multi virtual classrooms where we have a document camera, a PTZ camera, maybe a screen capture, and all of those are merged together. And that's probably more for the more technical professors. Now, some of the top video platforms that you should know about, and I'm sure most of the universities here um, already have a platform that they're using, but Echo360, Kaltura, OpenCast, Panopto, VidGrid, and Eula are all really popular uh, video management systems. Now, okay. Uh, Do you yes. mind if I just Please. interject here? We have, by the way, uh, sorry for putting Mark on the spot. He's with Adams State, not Arizona State. So oh. um, we do have some questions though in the chat and some really good questions. I'm just gonna go ahead in about two minutes and lock our meeting because I think we have most of our attendees here. But um, okay. a question about from Susan about the Simple Track 2 and can you set one camera to show a wide angle while the other tracks the instruction? And that is not really the case with the Simple Track. So, but I'll, I'll let you take that one. That's true. The, the, uh, the wide angle camera is just a reference camera. So it doesn't actually record the video um, with SDI or the USB connection. So um, you're right, Julia. That is just for the, um, that is just for the uh, video coming out of the main optical zoom, the 20X optical zoom camera. And, and Chris would like to hear uh, how the, the tracking camera, which we demoed, uh, the Simple Track 2, works with the Kaltura classroom. So I don't know how much experience, Paul, you have directly working with Kaltura. Well, um, generally, most of the customers that I've worked with using Kaltura uh, will capture the video with a uh, you know video lecture capture system like Echo 360, um, and there's there's others such as Sonic Foundry, and that'll capture and combine the video, whether it's the full video from the camera or the video and the presentation together, and then it will automatically. It, uh, send that video to Kaltura. Now, Kaltura also has a lecture capture software, um, which basically can bring in a webcam. So, luckily, the Simple Track 2 has a USB output. So, it just depends on how you'd like to ingest that video. Um, a lot of times in large classrooms, the camera, especially the Simple Track 2 with 20x optical zoom, is usually mounted on the far side of the room. And generally, you need to extend the video at least 25, maybe 50, 100 feet. So that's why the SDI connector is really popular, because you can run SDI 100 feet reliably, and then either plug it into an SDI video appliance or convert SDI to USB for use with Kaltura. But essentially, you know, you can record the, these videos with OBS, you know, the open broadcaster software for free. Or you can use something a little bit more advanced and automated, which most universities do, like Echo 360 or the Panopto, um, you know, hardware encoders that will record the video and then automate the publishing to the learning management system like Kaltura. Thank you, Paul. Um, Susan also mentioned that they're having a hard time, she's having a hard time finding webcams. Aren't we all, right? 
<laughs> yeah, we are having a hard time uh, with webcams. I will mention that uh, Huddlecam actually just released uh, two new webcams that are quite interesting. And I kind of wanted to show them off really quickly while we're on the topic of webcams, because for teachers, I think these are great. Let me, let me show you guys this webcam really quickly. And then I also wanted to mention that uh, the simple tracks are in stock. So I know that a lot of cameras have not been in stock lately. Luckily, the, uh, the Simple Track 2s are in stock. But this is the brand new Huddlecam HD 4K webcam. And it's only $299. And it's actually got a USB port on the back and an HDMI on the back as well. Um, and... It's one of the only webcams that has a feature called EPTZ. So you have the ability to kind of zoom in and out. So it has a 4K sensor, but when used with zoom, you know, it's probably 720, maybe even lower with zoom, maybe even 640 by 480. But we have the ability to set PTZ presets. So as a teacher, as a presenter, if there's a, you know, a faculty member that wants to have a little bit more presentation control, in maybe work from home environment, uh, I'll show you how a pre PTZ preset works. Um, you have the ability to do digital PTZ. And at $299 for, I think, a lot of professors, uh, there's a USB version and then there's actually an Ethernet version which uses NDI. So this is the only NDI webcam available. So just thought I'd show those off. Uh, they are they are back order. They sold out. Uh, I don't know even know when. I think that they'll be back in like four to six weeks. Uh, it's it's tough times for webcams right now. But getting back to our presentation. Thank you guys. All right. So we'll get back to our presentation. Okay. So that was the little the little bit on additional cameras and solutions, uh, you know, the USB 2 cameras, again, as you guys mentioned, very hard to find. Uh, they're sold out everywhere. Uh, when they do come in, they're generally back ordered, so they get shipped out. But the USB 3 models that we just showed, very powerful 4K, and that I believe is the future of a lot of webcams and online communications is digital zoom within a high resolution uh, camera. And at, at 299, it's really powerful. We showed the, the EPTZ camera presets there. There's an example of how they might be used by a teacher or a professor showing a wide view of the entire space and then also having the ability to zoom in. You know what, Julia? This is probably a good chance to really quickly show an awesome feature that is available inside of... Um, Zoom, which is the ability to do the far end camera control. So I just want to show this off really quickly because a lot of teachers don't know about this. If I right click Julia's video, I have the ability to request camera control. And so if I request camera control and Julia approves it, and Julia is using the HuddleCam HD, it. there we go. Now I have the ability to pan, tilt, and zoom her camera. So I didn't clean that corner of my office. <laughs> oh, you got I guess I just surprised you there. I see a little bit of a basket. Uh-oh. Um, but from a teaching perspective, if you have a teacher's assistant or somebody who's you know, able to pan, tilt, and zoom the camera for the teacher, um, that's a nice little feature. Um, and so I just wanted to show that off. Thank you, Julia. Sure, absolutely. Okay. It is, and that, that's something else that's, that's critical in all of this, especially for smaller institutions. You wanna adopt your technology smartly. So, you know, maybe it makes sense to get 10 webcams to start out. You know, investing in the Simple Track 2, it's uh, obviously, you know, the best camera out there. It's robotic, right? But it comes at a higher price point, so, you know, kind of bringing in that technology, you have the option to have 4K webcams, um, you know, that might be a great intermediary point. 
Yes, I agree completely. And, you know, it, it does totally integrate with Zoom. Uh, that was a question that I saw pop up in the chat. Uh, but you do need to enable remote pan tilt Zoom controls in Zoom in order for that to, 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 be a, to come up as an option. And we have some videos on that that, we, of course, we would be able to share. Um, so moving forward, lots of surprises today. Lots of random live demos. Um, now, I will mention that USB is great for web conferencing, but uh, these cameras also have HDMI, and HDMI is uncompressed, a lot higher quality than USB, generally speaking. It's not going to give you any higher quality in Zoom because Zoom is going to optimize everything for the bandwidth that you have. But if you're using a video switcher or something with HDMI, the HDMI will generally be better quality. And the UVC camera controls is the software, um, the hardware solution that allows for the zoom control. The other thing that's, that's interesting and new is called auto framing. And auto framing is built into the new Huddlecam HD Pro cameras. And auto framing allows uh, meeting participants to be framed from up to 20 feet away. It's not auto tracking. It just frames uh, a group of people. So for a small huddle room, or an educational space, if somebody walks in and just takes one chair, or there's a group of four people, it'll automatically frame them. And that is built into the Huddlecam HD Pro. So it's a nice little feature. Uh, there's also the Huddle um, View, which does this. But here's an example of maybe like an art, an art gallery, for example, where you'd be able to choose different PTC presets, and the output would be on top. And then on the bottom, you're seeing that kind of wide angle 4K view and that's, that's electronic pan tilt zoom. So we wanted to talk a little bit about technical implementations and then switch over to really talking about you know, Q&A for the forum and, and what, what folks are doing. But um, what we're seeing a lot of folks do is, is have like a Crestron matrix that can take a lot of different sources and then combine that with, with the video from like a simple track camera or a PTZ optics PTZ camera that comes into Echo 360 and allows them to you know, do the dual view, dual student view. So we're seeing that a lot in lecture capture. And then eventually it goes over to the learning management system. So we talked about that from the camera to the video management system to the learning management system. And all of this is going to transform the traditional classroom, obviously as a central focus on the presenter and the students being in room, but the flipped classroom which has really been adopted is, is content delivery, you know, happening at the student's leisure, if you will, so that the educational technologies are the online videos that students watch at home. And then you do the homework in class. And that really does lend itself well to the technology that we have available. And really the student learning, um, you know, uh, think about it, having the students do watch the videos at home and then do the collaborative work in person. Makes, it makes a lot of sense. So it's a paradigm shift for sure. This is nothing new. Um, these learning management systems are really built to have engaging video content and you know, really kind of bring the homework you know, to a new level. So I think that's great. I'm just going to um, just reiterate again this, this article I just found so interesting in Campus Technology. To, to reiterate all those points that you just made, Paul, about integrating with the learning management system and lecture capture, because uh, as, as the Arizona State professionals were quoted, you know, you can do a lot with Zoom, but it's not a substitute for creating full-blown, well-constructed online courses. And the fact that, you know, you find a, a great synergy, like we illustrated on the slide with the simple track and, and the other components, that way you can really create some robust online programming for your students and you know, not just completely abandoning that idea and, and relying on Zoom solely. However, Zoom is great to incorporate in that process. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it, it actually comes back to a higher level um, you know, technology. None of this technology is custom tailored to fit your organization. You know, they're building tools, that will work. And, and generally, at this point in technology, you're going to need a few tools. And hopefully, they'll integrate together. And luckily, there are APIs and integrations that are available, plugins 
that can increase the, the overall workflow. I'd love to hear what other folks are using to integrate Zoom with Kaltura, which I understand there's an integration there, um, and integrating these things together because not, not, not a single one is going to solve any problems and none of them come with a custom-tailored plan for your organization. That's for you to decide. And it's a collaborative process between yourself as the technology managers and you know, the teachers and what they, they would like to implement. Um, this is a simple scenario of a PTZ Optics USB camera um, being connected to the network. Uh, obviously, you can live stream with these cameras, but also connect them to a computer for a teacher's computer to record video to a learning management system. Uh, here's another example showing two USB cameras, maybe one on the ceiling and one wall mounted. We're seeing a lot of that out there. And then some classrooms and studios, auditoriums, theaters have maybe three or four cameras. And how do we control those? Well, obviously ethernet connectivity is, is, is ideal. So you can control it from anywhere on your local area network. Um, SDI is, is a great option, but you can also use NDI now. It's something we're open to, you know, having a conversation about. And then um, PCIe cards are cards that you can put into a computer to build in essentially three, four, five, six video inputs into a custom built computer. And uh, I think these are just some pictures here. Um, from some lecture captures and presentations. We were going to talk a little bit about eSports. I, I might go kind of quickly through it because um, eSports is really big. I uh, was just talking this morning with the University of Tennessee and their plans on eSports. And there's just so many universities adopting eSports. Um, I wrote a book called eSports in Education. It's been really well received. And with the launch of that book, we also launched the Stream Geek Summit and the idea of that was to get students not only playing esports in a in a tournament style setting where there's common ground between educators and students but also to give the students roles that are beyond just gaming and career paths uh, such as a camera operator on screen talent um, you know announcers journalists video producers there's so many great roles for students to be involved with an esports program beyond just competitive video gaming. Um, it's really become kind of from a teen's pastime to the international stage. And I know this is too small to read, but there's 80 plus STEM related science, technology, engineering, and math job careers that can stem from esports. So it's very interesting. Uh, we've learned a lot from hosting these esports tournaments. And just from a high level, and I'll do this quickly, uh, a basic, basic esports streaming setup would be uh, some gaming computers, an observer PC, and a production area. Um, so the observer PC essentially is on the same network as the gaming computers, and the observer PC can observe all of the, the video games, and that can be captured into a production computer and then live streamed and presented up on an LED screen or projectors or, you know, live streamed is really the, the key one there so that students can watch from home right now. Um, but the Observer PC generally uh, is, a, is a key component that a lot of people are, are just learning about now. It's, it's, it's If you're playing Rocket League with six other kids, you have a seventh computer that's an Observer and that, that Observer PC can be captured into the comp production PC. A lot of times we're seeing a uh, picture in picture. So we have a play by play announcer and kids love doing that um, and being part of it. It's almost like baseball uh, having an announcer there. And uh, we, can, we, we can share these slides later if, if anyone's interested in kind of the technical setup here. Um, but uh, there's a, really a, a lot of advancements that have been made in esports. And uh, we just, we did, we made it to the end of the presentation. Yay. So that's the end. And, and on about esports ball, um, we, we talk about that from a higher education perspective, but clearly esports is now coming on to the secondary level. Um, you know, it's really big with younger uh, students. So, you know, I think that's another thing that you, you, you might want to pay attention to, especially with the, uh, the current situation we're in. You know, that really has been the only way young children and teenagers could get together with their friends was through esports. 
Yeah, the esports explosion, you know, it was already happening before all of this. And now, again, it's one of those things that has moved forward five years in two months. And uh, higher education is, is right now v- paying very close attention to it because those are the students that are coming into the higher education institution now. And they've been in esports clubs, they've been in high school leagues, and they expect their colleges and universities to have an option for them. And uh, it's been really exciting to help. I've been involved, especially with writing this book and getting involved with the University of Tennessee and many others, uh, actually using this book to create curriculums and pass it around the university to kind of wrap your heads around the intersection of esports and education. For me, it's the most exciting, really, uh, part of esports. You know, great, there's, there's massive international tournaments. That's fun. And there's cool leagues and teams. But to see it integrated into education and turning the entire video gaming process into an educational process uh, is really inspiring what, what can be done there. And I, I can't wait to see the tech teachers, even the art teachers. Because, I mean, there's, there's art in these video games, right? There's economies and business in these video games. It's a giant booming economy, actually, right now in the midst of a recession. So there's so much opportunity for higher education to create careers and pathways and curriculums and, and even uh, master's degrees and uh, full degrees in esports. And on the, continuing on that topic, Patrick asked a great question. Um, he was curious whether esports are these exploding at schools that offer technical degrees more so than those that do not. Well, I don't know. Locally here, um, Patrick, in, in the Chester County area, Immaculata University has added esports as its newest varsity sport. And Immaculata is a historically, I would say, more of a liberal arts school. So I don't know that that's necessarily the case that it's exploding just at institutions that offer technical degrees. I think it's, it's becoming more of a mainstream thing. Yeah. Yeah, And just, sorry, go ahead. Follow up on what Julia was saying. Um, It's really being rolled out all over the place in a lot of different fashions. Um, You know, K through 12 is is now getting into, um, you know, the the game <laughs> but um but also universities historically are, are, are faster adopters of programs like these but it really is um across the board from public schools um paul was mentioning you know a lot of the career aspects coming from it um but it, you didn't mention you know a lot of the diversity the inclusion that esports offers versus traditional sports for you know various disabled students and stuff like that one thing um, that you know we heard at FETC, um, and there's a great um, you know organization out there that's working. I can't I can't remember the name of it. Paul, I think I copied you in, but they are the North American you know e- esports federation or something like that, and they're working with um, you know everything from you know public high schools to private high schools to you know all sorts of universities to roll this out in, in various functions, um, you know, and, and there's, there's everything from, you know, lemonade stand to like Rocket League, you know, and, and the various learning curves and, and various skills needed to, to learn those, um, you know, Animal Crossing being one, which is, you know, I think the hot one for everyone in quarantine, but it's very much uh, economy based. I believe, and, and building focused. So there's a lot of different schools being, you know, and, and you know, a lot of the individual um, program directors are rolling them out in, in their, you know, various schools and various fashions. So it's not just technical um, schools or technical degrees, but really everybody that's looking at this in, in some form or another. Yeah, so, absolutely. Thanks, Pat, for chiming in. So I guess, Julia, we should open up the forum to anyone who would like to, you know, bring up any topic that we can collaborate on together. Um, Julia, do folks need to ask to be unmuted? Oh, let's see. I I can certainly unmute anyone who would like to be unmuted. 
if they want to just raise their hand or just show me by a show of hands if they have a question. Um, we had just some comments in, in the chat and I'm looking on the Facebook and I'm looking on the YouTube stream and no, no comments right now for questions. Okay. Tom Willis is just commenting that his daughter recently graduated from Troy State College and several of her classes were online. Um, looks like there's more to the comment that I'm not, not seeing. Yeah. Yes. It says for someone who works full time, these online classes were great. I mean, um, I think so, so many of us can um, testify to that. I, I pursued my master's degree at night after working full time. So sometimes I would get home at like, you know, have to go into North Philadelphia to Temple University and get not get home until like 10, 11 o'clock at night after working all day. So ideally that would have existed a long time ago, which it did not for me. So I think that that online aspect is a great selling point for a lot of people, especially adult learners um, and people who, who need to have a job as well. Yeah. And uh, just to kind of echo that from a different perspective, a lot of higher educational institutions expect enrollment for adult learners to rise in, during a recession because uh, a lot of people decide to go back to school and work on their master's degrees and their different degrees that maybe they didn't have time to do while they were working. I mean, let's be honest, this is the largest unemployment rates we've seen in my lifetime uh, in many, many, many decades. And in general, higher education does see increased enrollments during recession. That's what we saw in 2007. So I think the numbers are clear that, you know, adult learners like to receive their, their training online. They may have kids, they need to stay at home and the ability to pause and take a moment to change a diaper and then go back or whatever you have to do in your adult life, uh, you know, like you said, you I mean you wish you had it there. There's so many conveniences there. You can also increase your reach quite significantly. You might find out that there are people across the country and across the world that might want to attend a specific, uh, you know, a course or degree offered from your organization that is not available in their local community. Um, so it also kind of hits the global scale as well. Right. And then there's the courses that you, you invest in or, or you choose to take because you, you just want to and you have the time. Like during this pandemic, I actually found myself through Coursera looking at all of the it was a cathedral course, a European cathedral course. And, you know, that was just something I do in the evenings when we, we were all in lockdown. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think education is um, an investment in human capital, as they say. Uh, we do have some questions in the chat. Pat's helping to answer those, Pat Kirby. So thank you so much. Um, we have a question from Glenn about the uh, new 4K huddle cam webcam working with the A10 Mini Pro. Um, he wanted you to cover a little bit more on that, if you wouldn't mind elaborating. Sure. I actually have the A10 Mini Pro here. And Glenn, to be completely honest, I haven't tested it yet. Um, so I'd like to do that um, I, because I have it. You know, I've got everything I need to do all the testing. I, there's no reason why it couldn't. This A10 Mini is an amazing product for just, uh, I believe it's only $299 uh, for a four camera switcher with a USB output. So imagine that uh, for a capture card. It's way better than a capture card all these buttons and everything. I just can't believe the pricing. And then there's an A10 Mini Pro, which I should probably purchase because that is 4K and the Huddle Cam webcam is 4K as well. So I'm going to step up my game on the A10 Mini uh, tutorials and get, get on that. That's such a good idea. And I've been looking for a new video to make. So let me um, do that tutorial soon for you, Glenn. Just subscribe to our channel and I'll get, I'll get that out soon. You're the best, man. Thanks for joining. Do we have any other questions? Anyone want to um, raise their hand if they feel like they'd like to ask a question that was not covered today?
Okay. Well, a good launching off point for sure. Um, expect more of these conversations in the months to come as you know, we're all preparing for unknown scenarios when it comes to my children. I have a high schooler and uh, a middle schooler and one still in elementary school. So, boy, we're hoping that they're going back to in-person school. <laughs> self <laughs> we're hoping for that. But, again, that's still a little bit of an uncertainty depending on how the virus is over the next couple of months. It's true. I feel the same way. And I know there are millions upon millions of people who are part of the educational system and uh, from a ch health, from a, a childcare perspective, from an educational perspective, we really want these to be open spaces for us to, to, to visit and, and engage with. Uh, campuses are beautiful spaces, not just for the students, but for everyone. And, uh, it's been an interesting time for sure. Uh, hey, Rick. Rick's got a question. Let's unmute Rick. Sorry. There we go. Hi. I work at a community college. I'm a sound technician, but I have an AV background in television. And so I'm familiar with advanced systems, electronics, and cameras. But if we were to install systems like this in our classrooms, um, say the Huddle Cam and uh, Echo, at what level do, once once the students are back in the classroom, at what level do the instructors need to understand the technology when they walk in the classroom? Are they expected to know how to turn on systems, how to obviously put a microphone on, but um, what have you found um, with these setups and, and the ease of use? Because uh, if we're not gonna have a technical support staff always available, uh, that's my, I guess my question. Well, that's a really good point. Um, I'll show this video because this is the one I keep on getting coming back to regarding uh, a college that I think has done a really good job. And what they've done is with Echo 360, they have lecture capture systems, but they also have a control system for the teacher. So at the front of the room, there's a touch screen and it's got a Crestron controller. So the Crestron system does everything from turn the lights on to open the shades to start the recordings, to actually providing annotation. Um, so the control systems in most higher education systems that I've found, although they are somewhat pricey, um, the ease of use is so important. So the, the auto tracking camera, the, the automation that that really does is just, it requires that there's no longer the need for a camera operator. Um, but it's still part of a larger system that's automated. In fact, the Echo 360 and many of the other lecture capture systems that are available, they automate the publishing to the learning management systems. And there's the touchscreen there. And you can see the Echo 360. And then you can, I think for a minute, you get to see the professor using that as an annotation device. But it, I, I, my answer to that question would be that essentially the... Um, the Crestron control systems and the different control systems that are available today uh, are doing the heavy lifting of making the system uh, easier to use from a you know click of a button perspective. Looks Thank like uh, our friend Michael Lisi finally joined. I apologize. We locked the meeting because we have had some Zoom bombing going on. And so I'm, I apologize, Michael, that you weren't able to get in. Oh, no, it's all, I just had to remember the secret handshake. But once I figure that <laughs> out, the door opened, and I get to be with y'all. Hey, well, Michael. Hi, everybody. Thank you How for joining. You? Maybe you could uh, share, because I know you work with a lot of higher educational institutions. Uh, is, is there anything you could share with us of what, you, what you're seeing out there? Are there any trends that you could share with us with some of the insights that you might have picked up? Oh, yeah. So... Um, right now, I mean, everyone's just focusing on how do I get a live camera and microphone in my meeting space, my classroom. And, and I think what you just said about how we need to minimize the joystick control requirement on the teacher because they're focusing on the content they're sharing. It's hard enough for them to remember the fact that there's remote students involved, but you don't want to make them have to manage their own video production. However, the real interesting caveat to this whole thing is when all education goes online, uh, students are going to have a choice. I mean, whether you go to one university or the other, the difference is the, the 
quality of the instruction, um, but you're looking at the same Zoom call. And so production value suddenly becomes much more important. If I have to sit at my desk or my, my, my home studio and, and consume eight hours of dimly lit, poorly, you know, barely audible uh, school content, with somebody projecting a camera at a washed out white screen, it's gonna get real old real quick. So suddenly the production value becomes so much more important. And I think what we think about is, okay, what can we economically then create a high quality production without again, teaching a teacher to, to mess with audiovisual production controls. And so what technology goes in that classroom to make that possible? Um, and then do we have to consider some pros production, lighting, camera angles, all that jazz. So it's interesting. I, one, I'll, one last point I'll make, you know, in the past, audio visual was, was getting sort of downplayed against IT. IT was the focus. Everything is information technology, but suddenly the way that things look and sound is more important than ever before. And the AV person is becoming more important in that whole conversation, right? That is really interesting. And the gentleman who we just who we just heard from uh, was talking about, he came from an audiovisual background, but now he is working at a community college, I believe in IT. So it'd be interesting to hear from him, but you're, you're right. Uh, and I don't know if Rick, could you, would you, uh, I'm guessing you'd agree with that. Yeah, I totally agree. I, um, yeah, what I noticed now that I'm working in community college is, is just what he mentioned. Uh, anything to do with video or audio, the weakest link usually is lighting or sound. And so that I can see is an issue, especially in classrooms where you're not set up for a studio kind of setting or lighting. And that's what I see when I look online nowadays with most of the classes, that even our own you know, instructors, is that poor lighting means everything to what you can see on the screen, to the text, to anything uh, that they're trying to show. So. And obviously, the more lighting you give the camera, the better. So, um, yeah, thank you for answering that. I was, it's definitely an issue. So I'm always being called by our instructors because they, they're not real familiar with AV. So that seems to be a common issue. Yeah, and a whole other element, too, is so you talk about audio. What do we do? I mean, how if the teacher wants to move around the room, um, am I going to go for an audio system with a ceiling microphone? Or am I going to go with like a lapel or a lavalier? And in some of the conversations we've been having, the other big gotcha is, ooh, you can't have anything that's shared. You can't have something that the last teacher touched because what if they had germs? So do we give everybody their own body pack? Do we, you know, how do we keep, create a hands-off experience? So not only, I can't even use that joystick controller unless I wipe it down with a Clorox wipe when I get done. And so there's also this element of like, I need you to engage my physical space, but don't touch anything, which is an interesting <laughs> caveat, right? Yeah, and I, another thing to add to that would be that I've heard, and you know, I don't want to be talking about rumors, but I believe that uh, we're going to be start higher education and schools are going to be maybe doing staggered days a little bit to reduce classroom sizes, and I know that's been at least talked about as a possibility. Um, so the spaces themselves might be used, you know, I would say for more days of the week, but less students in each classroom is what I'm hearing. Well, think about the MBA, and I, want, I don't wanna to take too much time, I'll say this, but think about the MBA model where a lot of your content is consumed off site. And then every so often, every couple of weeks, you get together and you have in-person networking and labs and such. I almost have to go to that model a little bit. And I've seen a lot of schools, like we just did a, a meeting and we had um, like Joe Way from USC and some other schools involved. And they're looking at it, well, we have this social distancing requirement. We can't put too many students in the same room. We're going to have to try and move as many students sort of online as, as is comfortable. And so suddenly you have this situation where, okay, if the majority of my content's online, but there still has to be an in-room component, just like you said, Paul, why don't we do some load balancing? And that changes your cost model because suddenly that one classroom that used to only be able to facilitate so many classes, well, if every course is only using that classroom once a week, even if I distanced um, every other hour. So I didn't have too many students passing each other in the hallway. I could still use that one classroom for 20 different courses in a week's time. And that minimizes the number of classrooms I have to create. And that also simultaneously increases my money available for the classrooms I do create. So going back to that conversation of production value, maybe I don't have to do hundred classrooms, maybe I only have to do 20, 
but I better make them look really good and sound really good so that whatever content gets created there, it, it's worth consuming, you know? Oh, totally. No. And Michael, this is, you know, this has been so refreshing to hear from you because I know that you're having these conversations all the time and you're bringing a lot of insights uh, and it makes so much sense. Uh, you really kind of jumped to the conclusions that could have taken us a lot longer. So I appreciate that. It's interesting because, you know, everyone's uh, taking a different approach. You know, California State University is going all virtual in the fall, yet Purdue and Notre Dame and even NYU, you know, New York City, the Epidemic Center saying they're going to be doing in-person classes and they're just going to be taking every precaution. So it's not going to be a federally mandated thing. There's going to be a lot of different types of scenarios, but... uh, I'm assuming it's really up to the individual um, universities to make the best decision for their unique uh, offerings that they have. But the overall goal is going to be, you know, it, or I guess the overall trend will be a move online, I'm sure. Did you talk about some of the new funding that came out? So I had a lot of schools talking about, hey, I got oh. CARES Act funding. I got I got millions of dollars to spend. What am I going to do with it? And th- and that's And on the other hand, you have schools going, I got money to spend, but there's no inventory. The industry has been being dried up immediately since every school wants to buy everything that has a camera attached to it. And manufacturing has been, you know, put in a chokehold for the last two and a half months. How do I, can I even get equipment fast enough for my fall install? You know, I I don't know. I'm I'm showing late. So yeah, no, that that's no, we haven't really mentioned that. I mean, we mentioned that there's no webcams available. Luckily I did also mention that we do have lots of simple tracks in stock. We just got a, a giant order of those. So those are in stock. But um, yeah, most things are on back order. And I did not hear about this funding. Can you tell us a little bit more? Yeah, interesting enough. So we just had somebody um, who's involved in grant writing uh, meet with our team last week to talk about what grants are available for schools and different sectors, um, how much money is available, how to find those those resources, and uh, how to basically... Pr- put forth a grant request to get access to those funds. And what's really interesting about a lot of this funding, I mean, you saw that the $2.2 trillion stimulus package um, had a lot of text in it about like tribal organizations, Indian reservations. Um, Also, there was a lot, I mean, 30 billion was set aside just for education. And it was to offset costs related to um, of delivering instruction virtually. And it is very kind of loosely arranged. I mean, they came out with that legislation so fast that it was very generic and and kind of vague as to what can I spend the money on. Now, after they came out with those grants, now they're sort of further refining how you can spend the money. But what we're finding is there are there is money set aside by the government and they have to spend it within six months of when it came out. So basically by August or July, they've got to spend the money. And it and because so. What that puts is there's a grant person's job is to read, you know, approve stamp or reject stamp as fast as possible, because if they don't spend the money, then they failed. So their interest is, do you meet the requirements? Yes. Check. Money's on your way. And um, and what's also interesting is it sounds like the deadlines for some of these grants, it's all at once. So you still have time to craft a compelling story of how this money would enable you to serve your community. Um, and, and they're going to review all applications at a certain date. And that's different. Sometimes grants are like first come first served. So the people who do get in earliest get all the money. And then if you show up two weeks later, too bad, it's all gone. But a lot of these grants have been written where we have a deadline for when we're going to finish collecting everything, then we'll review and sort through it. So there's a good chance you can make a, a good case for why you should be getting this funding. And, um, and in some cases, actually, I'll say one more thing I found interesting. Some of this grant money, though they need to award it by the end of summer and it and it, it needs to be delivered to you by September, you actually don't have to spend all the money right now. Um, basically, there's a commitment to fund up to like a million dollars, for example, in one grant. And that was just one grant from the USDA we were looking at. But you have you, you have to implement it over the next three years. So you can get the money and get approved and then you spend like a fraction of it before the end of the year. And then it kind of enables your rollout. So yeah, I think helping people figure out that this is available to them and helping them leverage it is a big, is a big opportunity. Um, and that's well, kind of maybe we could do a, a follow-up uh, webinar maybe next week to uncover some of these opportunities, Michael. 
love to. We got a lot going on, but I, um, we're, we're in the planning stage that emailed you about this virtual collaboration experience that we're going to be doing related to like the big Infocom show. And what we're gathering right now are, are topics that people want to talk about. And then we're going to be hosting live. And so um, I would love even for, for, you know, your viewers and, you know, people that have ideas about these topics to kind of get into the conversation and we can do this together. Cause I think everyone's looking left and looking right to find out like, what, what should I be doing right now? And nobody wants to make a mistake or do it on their own. So we're all trying to learn from each other as fast as we can. Um, and so both ears are open and people who have something to say, it's like, we'll take it. <laughs> Anything you've got, please share. I love it. Well, let me, let's, let's do that. Thank you so There's much. No time, like no time, like the present to collaborate. I mean, that's just such a great point because there, again, there are so many unknowns, but, but planning is, is essential. So thank you. That sounds really interesting, Michael. And I love the, honestly, I love this group of people that, that are part of your um, think tank, Paul. Like I think the, the, the videos and you produce week by week and the content, you just got a lot of smart people here with a lot of brain trust. And so I'm going to like to tap on a lot of you as well to join. <laughs> I, I like being a part of the conversation. So thanks for having me. Well, I'm excited what you put together, Michael, over there at Wolf Vision. I can't wait to see it. And I mean, I'm going to try to get some of your time next week and see if maybe we can we can join join together and maybe maybe try to do a show on the opportunities with grants for technology and education. Um, and I apologize for locking you out of the Zoom meeting. I would have loved to have you here earlier. Uh, no. It's something we got we've gotten Zoom bombed a couple times, so we're locking it. I think Julia has been locking it around 20 minutes into the show. I, I'm sorry about that. No, it's great. I'm sorry, late. That's all. All right. Well, that's pretty much our show. It's been an hour. I'm going to try to get Michael Lisi over here from Wolf Vision to join us next week. We'll see if we can get his time. But thank you, everybody, for spending this hour with us. It's been a great show. It was all recorded. And we're going to get the um, PowerPoint presentation embedded into our blog. So that'll be available within 24 hours if there was something there that you missed. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. See ya.